you zoom recording all right and here we here we go well good good morning thomas how are you doing i'm doing well i'm ready to get going so how are you doing i'm doing fine this is kind of a, a melancholyish edition of our tips oh yeah yes changes are coming <laughs> Yeah, change is happening. So uh, for those that are uh, new to this, uh, thank you for joining us. Tom and I have been doing this. I, I need to go look at this. It's almost four years, I think. Somewhere around there, yeah. Yeah, and it's not been every month, but we're trying to stay pretty regular. Um, so this is the last episode where we'll be doing this format with the voting. So we're going to continue doing stuff, but it's going to change in the new year. Uh, so we don't yet have a date set for January. So January, February, Tom and I will figure out schedules and we'll get something out there. We'll still share 10 tips, uh, but there won't be the battle royale. So I think, I think we're in agreement here. Currently on the leaderboard, you have two of the stats and then we're tied on a third. And so today is it, like at the end of this, this is, uh, yeah, there will no longer, Larry, there will no longer be the battle royale. It will be uh, just us working peacefully together, ribbing each other still. That won't go away. <laughs> but to make a public service note, yeah. yes, would you like to support the underdog here? Tom would be happy to get all your votes. <laughs> because underdog, because you're at the it, top of the stats. Come on, you're the you're not underdog. Well, oh, I'm, 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 I'm sorry. It's just, you know, I, I hit below the belt the whole bit. I'm, I'm going to take course. whatever I can. Ooh, I like the new intro piece here, my friend. Yes, yeah, so that's a change for those that have been participating. So I have a new job. I'm now the Microsoft go-to-market director for AvPoint. So essentially what that means is I am responsible for the AvPoint and Microsoft relationship, and especially from the product side of the house, um, and so it's, it's a yeah, new role, very excited, it happened very quickly all this month. Um, but I've, you know, known and worked with, uh, you know, AppPoint for many years and they've, they've been a client of uh, collab talk, still doing collab talk community stuff and still MVP, RD programs, all that kind of stuff. But now I've got this other role with, with AppPoint. So, but they're, they understand the community side. They, they. Uh, are happy to continue supporting uh, things like this, but uh, we're like, we'll talk about it next month when the new format comes out. But anyway, that's me. That's my blog at Buckley Planet. Um, all of the recordings of this, this so the, today's webinar, uh, the links to the slides, all of that, it will be made available out on uh, Buckley Planet or out on the, my YouTube site, on uh, which is under Collab Talk. Uh, and so with that, Tomas. So basically, they still get the product, just slightly different packaging. Correct. Great. F fancier packaging. Uh, <clears throat> yes, there you go. As for me, all that stuff is exactly the same because I haven't gone anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. I'm still doing the same thing. Awesome. You're, you're, you're almost snowed in. So yeah, you're not. Going I am almost there. snowed in. So I really can't go anywhere as the case may be. <laughs> Um, basically work for an insurance firm out in the Pacific Northwest, but I'm based in Minnesota specifically where we're expecting to get another five to eight inches of snow today yay minnesota uh, yeah minnesota, you gotta start talking minnesota, to minnesota. I know. yeah don't you know, don't you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a little, little hot dish after i get done here for my lunch <laughs> uh you will find these tips and many other ones that i do on my blog one minute office magic.com so feel free to visit there and subscribe or follow or whatever wordpress allows you to do with that and with that, Christian, yeah. let's lay out the ground rules for the final well, leaderboard. The final here, here's count. Here's where down. we are. So there's the beginning. So it's been so it's been three years since we officially started doing this. So right there, 9, 12, 2017. Um, no, I guess that is four years. This is bizarre yeah, how years. close this is. Yeah, three three and a half years. All right, yeah, because we were talking before that. But anyway, yes, there look how close that is over three and a half years. That's inc incredible. That is really unreal. And it's been a lot of fun. I, I remember when you first brought this up, it's like, I'm going to get creamed out on a regular basis. <laughs> uh, and the fact that it has stayed neck and neck and nobody has built a huge lead over the years. 
Yeah, it, it has been back and forth uh, to look at the lead changes. But here's the rules of engagement. So we're going to take turns. We're going to go through where we always cover 10 uh, tips. Tom and I don't know what the other person is going to present. So uh, there is a chance. It's happened twice where there, uh, we've duplicated. And so we have, in theory, we have backups. Tom, do you have any backups today? Maybe. I do not. It'll be interesting. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, so I mean, the I, water here. <laughs> so I, yeah, I have another deck. So it's unformatted. I have some other items. It's my V next deck. So if needed, <laughs> I'll pull from that. But yeah, so there are no duplicates. Um, if there's a duplicate in the past, if there's been a duplicate, if we've uh, or if we've covered something and we absentmindedly went back in. And, and talked about an item that had already been covered. That's happened a couple of times. Both of us have done that as well, right. where we will then in the you know post event, we will go and replace that with a new item. We'll take zero votes for that one. We'll lose that round. Uh, but you but we will- get 10 new tips. Yeah, well, always 10 tips. Um, audience votes at the end of each round. So we'll do the polls. Uh, we say no hitting below the belt. You Tom. know, Christian, since this is the last one, I promise that I will punch up this time. Liar. I don't okay, believe that fine. at all. You're yeah. right. <laughs> I tried. No, we I have really the, tried. The, and so it's the grand poobah of the event after this, and then we go from there. So, all right, let's get started. I say, I, I agree with you. This is a bit melancholy. These are, I, I don't have any like huge zinger ones. These are some, just some cool things, things that I've been using, like, I think I'll write about that one, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Round one. Ding, ding. Uh, capture and share web content in Microsoft Edge. Tom, are you an Edge user? Um, I was, but then I had a problem where I was getting weird, funky errors trying to connect to our SharePoint Online client. Yeah. I gave it up. Yeah. And I finally got it back, but it's I've never gone back and tried to put things back in place to use this again as my primary. Well, it, it, you know, except for the issue when you change browsers and you do things like you go to your bank and other things like the password reminders and those kinds of things that you just kind of get lazy around. And I use a third party tool, LastPass. So it's less mm -hmm. of an issue for that. But there are some things like WordPress for my blog. It doesn't quite work the same. Uh, it, it, it's not really designed to work with and it's just not fully functional inside right. of Edge and the new Edge Chromium browser does a lot of cool things. But so I have a couple sites that I have to use Chrome for. I could use Firefox, but for the majority of, if I click on a new link to something by default, Edge, which is just faster, cleaner, and has a lot of cool features that I'm using more and more. And one of the features is the ability to go in and easily capture and mark up web content. So just to show you how that works really quickly. So I've got this browser, here's my blog. So if you go up to the uh, top right, the ellipses and pull the drop down, you can select web capture. And when you do that, you get this free selector. You can just grab the, 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 the full page. And I use a third party tool for that. And what I find with it, that other third party tool, um, it, it, uh, it's a bit slower than this. This is just a much faster method. And what's nice about this is especially with the free select tool. So drag that down around the item is then you can go and add, you can just copy that, paste that into an email, into a Word doc, into uh, you know whatever, save it as a file, uh, as that, that image, or you can go in there and annotate. So add notes, um, go in, change the color of the pen, um, mark it up, change the line thickness. So whatever you wanna do and highlight there, um, and then from there, you can again, copy, paste that into a source, save it as an image file uh, or share it. And when you select share, just like every other, you know, office application, you select who, internal, external, uh, whether you want to, uh, you know, via your Wi-Fi, find other devices and, 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 you know, simulcast it to another location or send it via one of the many tools that you have uh, within your system. So it's just a quick and easy, don't need a third party tool. Um, it's really fast, has some great features. Um, one of the things I've been doing more and more has been using that and clipping these things and parts of articles with links 
and putting that in, over into OneNote. And so that's my you know, alt tab to move back and forth between browser and OneNote as I'm capturing image and notes um, and then marking that up and doing more of my annotations in OneNote uh, around this. But this is you know, what I'm using more and more. Well, what's nice too about <clears throat> taking the image like you had there and moving it into OneNote, OneNote then turns into your OCR. So right. if you want to get that text and be able to use it in one of your reports or something, you've got that ability. So that's a really cool thing. I didn't know this existed in Edge. Um, I yes, like it's Snagit. A, it's, a, it's a newer capability. Yeah. yeah I use Snagit as well. But, it, but I can see where this would be like a real, it would, it would beat the whole, um, what's the clipping tool, Snippet or? Clip it, snip it. There's a few of them. It keeps changing back and forth. The one that Microsoft snag has it. and snag. Yeah. It just like, eh, you know, they keep changing it. And that's like my real low end. Hey, I just want to do a search for, you know, snip and it brings up the snipping tool and I do it real quick, but I prefer snag it because I've got the whole editor tool that I can see everything and do all the stuff I need to do. This would enable me to do again, the quick and dirty stuff where I just need to grab something, get the image and then paste it into an email or something. That yep. would be, you know, All right, Tom, cool. over to you. I like it. Uh, so let me Okay, where am I at here? Share screen. Host disabled participant screenshot and <sighs> only a participant. You did this to me last uh... month. Dude. Everybody who's on the call, remember, he's making it. All right, very you are now difficult. a co-host. Why, yes, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a recent change that came out in Teams, which is really nice. Because we used to get a lot of complaints about people going, you know, I'm really tired that if I'm not in Teams directly, five minutes away from Teams and it puts me in an away status. It's like, I'm still here, but people think I'm away and I'm not, and I have to keep going back. So the question was, is there any way to lengthen the time before you get these status changes? And before this came out, and this was only like a couple months ago, the answer was no, there's really not. Well, now there is, which is awesome. So if you're in Teams <clears throat> and you go up to your profile image and you, you know, click the, the, image and it gives you all the information that you have, you'll now see a new option called duration on the pop-out menu when you're looking for your settings. And when you hit that one, there we go, it now gives you for whatever status you're in, you can now place custom times. You can either say, hey, I don't want it to reset for 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, all of today, all of this week, uh, custom, I think this is great because while I do a lot of things in Teams, I don't necessarily live in Teams. And I don't like people to think that I'm away five hours of the day when in reality, I really am working, boss. Um, this is something that you can use to make sure that people are seeing you, they know that you're around, you actually have a legitimate status of I'm here, I'm busy, I'm available, whatever, and it's not going to keep reverting back to a way. So definitely check this out in your Teams client. If you haven't seen it already, uh, I love it. I use it quite frequently. I'll just say that if there are any uh, Microsoft people that are watching this, uh, the recording or the live, um, I think it to say that you don't live in Teams is blasphemy. And <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I visit it nearly all day long. I just don't know that that's my house right now. <laughs> uh, well, the poll is live. We'll give you uh, a few seconds to do that. Yeah, it, it's funny. Um, I mean, I used to uh, it just depends on uh, the activity on the day. And there's some days where I'm just in teams the entire time. Uh, and, uh, you know, other days where barely touch it, I respond to a, a couple chats. Um, yeah, so. from a development side, since I'm in the midst of the whole SharePoint designer migration type stuff, uh, I'm usually spending a lot of time in the browser, in Flow, and in SharePoint designer doing things back and forth. So, uh, 
then I'll go back over to Teams when I see something pop up. Usually Sandra going, hey, you got some time? So I go back over there and make sure that, yes, I do, Sandra. Okay, five more seconds. If you've not yet voted, please get your vote in. And we'll end the poll. And Tom, 60%. Congrats. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you. All right, round two. You love me. You really love me. <laughs> <laughs> Let me close off the poll thing here. <clears throat> so this is also a relatively new feature. And if you're in a Teams meeting and you've had you know, a number of attendees and for some reason you need to be able to see who was on the call and get a list of attendees and the whole bit, it really hasn't been easily possible before now. And even with the before now, there's still a little caveat on that one too. <laughs> But they have made a feature available to you now in Microsoft Teams meetings called Download Attendance List. So once your meeting is over and before you leave the meeting, it's not an option once you leave the meeting. So that's one of the caveats. Well, wow, that's a big caveat. <clears throat> it really is. Because once you're out of there, it's like, hmm, too bad. Hmm. They are, I believe, doing additional changes in which case this will be available for longer. And the information I'm about to show you on the second slide will be slightly different. But first pass, this is the rule. Click on the ellipsis. Don't leave the meeting until you do this. And this is only for the person who's actually running the meeting. Once you do that, you can then export it, which is exports to Excel. And you get something like this, the full name of the person, when they joined, when they left, and the timestamp. Now, um, my fiance, my partner, who's upstairs in the other office, she, I heard her describe this to somebody and she said, yes, this report is semi-useful after some manipulation. I thought, really? And once I looked at it, it's like, yeah, I get it. Because every time somebody joins and leaves the meeting and comes back in, you get another entry for them. So as you can see here, I joined the meeting, I have one entry. I left the meeting, I have another entry. I rejoined the meeting, I have a third entry. <clears throat> to make it a little bit more problematic, if you're allowing anonymous users to join the call, they all join with a full name of blank. So if you're trying to do deduplication of things, um, yeah, you, you gotta kind of play around with it. Because in this, I would look at it and go, I have four entries, I had four attendees. No, you really had two. And if I had a bunch of blank entries, I couldn't really tell if that was one person who kept leaving and joining or whether that was a number of people who were joining and that was all valid. I guess you could figure out if you had like, you know, four joins all in a row that had blank names that those are four valid people. But again, you got to do a lot of manipulation to give it a level of usefulness that you can make some assessments on how many people did join. I can't tell you for sure. <clears throat> this is better than what you had before, which was nothing. <laughs> it's not perfect right now, but you could be getting closer to it. Keep an eye open in this space. But again, if you have to go out and try to get names of people, especially if you're not using anonymous users, being able to download this and then do a deduplication in Excel is going to give you a list of names, which is far better than you've been able to work with before. So, yeah, Daniel has a question of whether uh, people in the meeting can add their name somehow to the team. I mean, is there? I, um, I was thinking no. like anonymous users. He's saying no, like people using a landline, people dialing in. Yeah, I'm, I'm really not sure, Daniel. I, I haven't gone through. Usually I'm just an attendee in a Teams meeting. I'm not actually running the thing. Uh, I could see where occasionally you will have something where they say, hey, join the meeting. Yeah, I want to join. And they'll say, enter your name. So I could type in Tom instead of it coming out as Thomas Duff. Uh, that would help. I don't know if you have that option, though. I don't think you a good do. question, though. Another one of those examples of Microsoft, a lot of people clamoring for this, wanting this feature, and then they give you something that's not quite what we yeah, want. Yeah, it's <laughs> so close there. So very, very close. Good, good try, Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh. 
good times good times it's it's uh it's funny because the pain is real yes it is <laughs> <laughs> all right uh back order so my round two item uh sticky notes and outlook on the web i'm glad i did not use this one uh, oh, i yeah, was considering it <laughs> it's cool so so there's um there's, there's been talk for for years and and tom and i've had conversations about this and and Tom and I are both huge you know, OneNote users, but I, I'm a, you know, the, the like the physical note taking guy. So I have a yellow notepad next to me. I have colored sticky notes that are on the desk, on the, on the monitor. I use to do, I use planner, I use OneNote. Uh, I, I keep track of, of create tasks like outlook based tasks for a project manager, but I, I like capturing at that point and then aggregating those things together uh, so i don't lose that thought lose that task that action item and this is just yet another tool i'm now using uh so i have my new company email i've got my company laptop but i have open in the browser uh i'm using more and more of outlook in the browser and, and then i have my other my uh, you know collab talk my community email uh, my home email open in the desktop application. And it's been some of these new features are just really cool. And I, so I'm kind of using all of the above, but what this looks like, and you can follow the link and read more about it. So when you go into Outlook on the web and you see, you know, very clean, this is it's so pristine. It'll never look like this ever <laughs> again. Um, <laughs> In, so down in the bottom left, you can see I've got it highlighted, the notes section, and it's clear, and you can see right up at the top where you can, uh, you know, add a new note. Um, so there's the notes section, there's where you add the new note uh, uh, up at the top left. And as you add those items, and you can change the color of those items, you can add in, of course, text, you can do annotations, you can add images. I go and grab screen captures from around. I pull images and text and actions out of emails. I can post a note, one of these sticky notes. I can drop it into an email. Um, so it, it's it's a great utility. And one of the cool features beyond this um, is that you know it, it, not only does it keep them all in one place. But I don't have this uh, where I've just started playing with this. So I don't have it integrated to my new work OneNote yet. So there's nothing in my work OneNote to show this. Um, but that you actually can get right into your OneNote feed. And then you can share notes and images from the OneNote feed and most recently visited or created uh, notes over in OneNote into your Outlook or vice versa. And so it's just another panel view uh, allows you to move notes and action items across uh, each of those things. So really cool features, especially, I mean, what I'm most excited about is with the deeper integration that we're getting into tasks with planner and to do, and to be able to do that across notes. I don't believe that integration is there yet. I need to go play with that, but I don't believe that's there yet today in these notes but it has been something that's been mentioned so that wherever you create a task, even within these sticky notes, that it will then consolidate if it's a personal one into your to-do view um, or that it could be shared over to planner uh, for more of a team view of those tasks. Well, and this is something that I wanna start <clears throat> doing a little bit more with in 2021 because- Getting organized? I <laughs> that too. Yeah, that would help a lot. <laughs> you don't know how truthful and painful that was. Um, but I tend to use like one wiki page in Teams. And I thought, yeah, no big deal. It's just pretty much some cut and paste stuff that I need to use on a regular basis. And I remember looking through, like, I think it was Facebook. <clears throat> and people were like, they need to kill the wiki and teams and you should be using OneNote. And I'm like, hadn't really thought about that. And being able to use OneNote in this type of a format, because I too have switched over to using Outlook on the web, that would make it really easy to grab the little snippets of things that I need to do on a regular basis. Well, you know, um, so. What's cool about this is, that is, is the cross workload integration that's happening with tasks, 
with the sticky notes with OneNote itself so that mm -hmm. you can use it on the desktop or the web. You can use it on your mobile device. You can use it uh, you know, integrated through Teams and have it show up in a number of different ways for your meeting notes, um, you know, shared or personal, and all have it roll back to that one place, all stored within the cloud, pull it in, be able to add and annotate via the sticky notes into OneNote. It's just really cool what they're what they're doing. I mean, yeah. I've been, you and I have both been longtime fans of, of OneNote, and I think Sticky Notes concept was originally in OneNote. It's been extended now over into Outlook on the web. It's just cool to see. Yes, it is. All right, five more seconds in the poll. If you've not yet voted, I'm going to close that up. Four, you, you did a dust up on me that time. In the poll, yeah, 70%. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> All right, let's jump into round three. So this one is just, uh, I, I'm living this because I just, I've got a survey that's been out and, uh, and live. If you've not seen it, I've been uh, trying to, to get people who are admins to respond to a security compliance and governance pulse survey um, that, that ends in another two and a half days. Uh, but you now have the ability to um, allow people to upload files. And so it's just another complex question type in the further expansion of Microsoft Forms, which I'm a fan of. There's a lot of positive, especially if you're doing something within the enterprise or for a set of known users. But like this pull survey, which is an anonymous survey, I just pushed it out, I've made it available, I've asked people to self-select. Um, I probably wouldn't risk allowing anonymous people to upload files that I would then go and look <laughs> at. That's me. I wouldn't do that, but you could. But to get started, so you just go into your, your forms.microsoft.com, uh, but you can, uh, you know, the drop down on the far right, you can see there you've got the file upload option. So when you select that, it creates that question type. And so you can give that instruction, say, you know, if you want to say like, if you selected other in the last question and would like to you know, submit a sample or submit your resume or whatever it is, um, you can have them do that. Be, you know, be fun is like a team scavenger hunt where they have to take pictures of the Ooh, item next to it. That would be fun. That they did it. Yeah, I, I just like thought that of that. I, I, I'm just thinking of what we could do for our family outing on Friday for New Year's. We there you go. Um, but anyway, so you have that. And of course, uh, from this view, um, you, you, this is the view once you've completed that, uh, this generic example from the user perspective where they just go and select the upload. When they click the upload, they get the standard upload, the, the uh, uh, Explorer uh, window that opens up. They select from all of their local and cloud resources. Once they've uh, attached something, that's what it is. They hit submit. It submits, they complete, of course, the rest of the survey. I just had that one question. It thanks them. And then immediately the admin. So in real time, you're getting these responses back. And so I'm able to go in. In fact, I've got a screen open right now where I'm monitoring that, uh, that public survey uh, and watching the stats as they come in. And somebody spammed it. And I was able to go in and clean out the spam, <laughs> so throw off the other researchers. Um, but right there, then you can go in and look at the details. Um, so it's just a nice, another option. I know this is not a big, sparkling, exciting feature. This is just one of those things where like, I've needed this for quite some time and well, actually, it's finally there. Yeah, actually what we find really great about that particular feature is <clears throat> when forms came out first, I was like, oh great, a survey tool. Don't know how frequently I'll use it, but it's a survey tool. Well, very quickly, we made the mind shift that it's really not necessarily just a survey tool. It can be a very simplistic, quick to put together front end data entry tool. Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, and we use a form for saying, hey, if you'd like customized support from the SharePoint team, please fill out this form. And we give them the option to create an attachment. And the attachment could be you know, a screen print of what they want to have fixed or a Word document of, you know, what they think's going on. And it works out really, really well. Yep. And 
that was a huge thing for us to be able to put attachments in there because it gave so much more flexibility to use it as a data entry tool instead of just a survey. You know, we've talked about this before and I'll just highlight it again. One of the things that I love about this is also for as a training tool, you can embed forms, uh, questions into a PowerPoint um, that you can then go publish on a SlideShare or OneDrive or, uh, or create a Sway where you might have like a, a example where you might have a bunch of a sway, a bunch of text, a video that people need to watch, and then ask them three questions about what they just watched. And then you can check the answer. So you can be onboarding people into your company and have them go through a bunch of material. And when it gets to that part of the presentation, they have to answer a couple questions to see if they were paying attention. And in real time, you can capture the stats. So you can actually be at the front of a room of people, 100 people that you're onboarding into your company that you're training and look at the real time stats of whether people are paying attention or not. Yeah, one thing to keep in mind <clears throat> with forms and PowerPoint, like you were talking about, is there's an add-in that's needed in PowerPoint to be able to use your form. Yes. Um, and up until just recently, I'm going to say like within the last two to four weeks, that was something that, you know, you had to ask your tech support to install for you and the whole bit. Well, now there's a feature that's being rolled out here really soon where you can have your admin basically say, yeah, that add-in's enabled for all your PowerPoint. So nice. if this is something that you are looking forward to or that you'd like to use, you may want to check and see if one, do you have it on an individual basis? And if not, is there a way to get it rolled out to use forms within PowerPoint for your entire tenant? Yeah. If you've not started playing <clears throat> with the forms and embedding that into other artifacts, uh, you definitely need to go take, spend some time, take a look. Definitely. So let me go ahead and share my screen now. It was funny, I was really kind of hoping here at first that I had my thing set up properly because I do have a form thing coming up. It's just not this one. <laughs> so <clears throat> this is a feature that we ran into. I think it had actually been out there for a while, but I just got around to looking at it. We've had on a number of occasion people go, hey, I need to see who viewed a particular document in a document library or a page. And SharePoint historically has not been really good in terms of stats, in terms of who viewed what. Uh, you can see like counts, but in terms of seeing individuals, it's been a lot more difficult. Well, now there is a site feature called SharePoint Viewers. And in SharePoint Online, it will give you that kind of information of who's actually seen this. And so if you go out to site settings for your site, go out to site actions, manage site features, and you will see an entry, they're all alphabetical, so it'll be towards the bottom, called SharePoint Viewers, click active, or click activate. In my case, it was already active. Uh, and it takes like maybe five seconds and poof, you're ready to go. So here's what it looks like before. I'm in a uh, library here, and when I click on the ellipsis and it tells me I've had 13 views, like, okay, but who has viewed this? I have no way to tell. <clears throat> and I have a place to show viewers, I'm just not seeing any of them. Where now, once you activate the feature, you'll see that 13 views again when you click on the ellipsis, but now you're starting to see the people circles as to who's actually been viewing this. And if I come down here and expand out, if I click on the 13 views link, it shows me that, hey, I've had two viewers, there's been 13 views total, and it shows me that Sandra and I have been the two people who have looked at this. And even better, if you click on the viewers link, you also get this viewers by week information. So now it not only shows me who viewed it and when they last viewed it, but it also gives me the ability to see when the viewing has taken place in aggregate. So I could go to previous weeks and maybe I saw a huge spike as part of some campaign that our company was running and then things leveled off to nothing. Or I can see that three months ago, this was really popular. Nobody's looked at it since then. Do I need to get rid of it? Do I need to somehow, you know, boost the signal to get that back out there again? 
this is a tool that you didn't really have before, or you had to have admin capabilities to go in and see site statistics. And even then it was a little questionable here. It's like right up front. So I I do have a comment, Tom, that you seem to be focusing today on the big brother features is what's going on. (laughs) I really can't tell you. (laughs) If I did, you would be in in worse shape. Yeah. Uh, Sherry asks uh, whether the viewer stats are exportable. Um, not from here. I suppose if you did start to go, uh, try to check out like site statistics, maybe there'd be something you could do, but for right now, no, it's not viewable at this panel. Like all of this kind of stuff, it's, if, if it's available within the system, it's captured, it's available via the API. So there yeah. is a way to get to that data with a little development help. Yeah. So that one's mine. All right. Well, I've got the poll launched for round three. Yeah, there's there's another one that I have coming up here that's kind of like, you know, it does what it says it does on the box. Doesn't do much else beyond that. (laughs) If you want to do something more than that, you're probably still going to have to do something on your own, but. Yep. We'll get about uh, well, another 10 seconds. So the SharePoint views versus the forms capability. Do, 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 do. Four, three, two, one. All right. Tom, you took round three. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Okay, so let us <clears throat> proceed to four. So here's my Microsoft Forms one. That again, I wish I had had that number three because then we could have gone Forms versus Forms. This has to do with progress bars, responder progress bars and forms. So I'm sure you've all had surveys that you've been filling out, maybe even Christians, who knows? Uh, <laughs> and you'll sit there and you'll answer questions and you say next. And you'll answer more questions, you're like next. And after about the fifth next, you're like, when's this going to (laughs) end? You know, am I going to be here for the next 30 minutes? Or is the next next the last next? And I'm done with it at that point. Well, now what you can do in forms is if you have different pages or different sections in your survey, you can actually use a a responder progress bar to give your people who are filling this out an indication of how much more information they have to provide because they're in the middle of it and they can't tell where the end is. So in this case, you do your survey. And if you go to your survey here and you have sections, you have this option for show progress bar. That's all you need to do is just turn it on. And once you turn it on and you start filling out your survey, in this particular case, this was my first page. There's another page after this. But I can tell, hey, I'm on page one of two. And so I know when I click next, I'm going to have a wrap up screen or I'm going to have one additional question to answer and I'm done. And it's not such a big deal when you're you know, talking about a two page survey here with only two questions and two options in each question. But if you're doing something that is an in depth survey that has a number of questions and a number of pages and perhaps you're not showing them certain pages, but the person's like, I really need to know how much more time I'm going to have to commit to this thing. This is a really good feature to turn on. I really can't think of too many instances where if you have a multi-page survey, you probably wouldn't want to turn this on. But definitely use this. Your users will thank you. And one of the things I like as an admin of the forms is in the stats, it does tell you the you know the 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 average completion time that it takes. Oh, cool! Um, so you're getting some data as the forms owner, right? But you're right. Having the progress bar, I think, uh, you know, certainly helps. Because I I've done that where I've started to take a couple surveys. I answer five or six questions, and it's showing like five percent completed. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I get this. I'm out. But, I hope there's a question here. I can say no, and it's going to bump me to ninety like real <laughs> quick. <laughs> uh, all right, let me grab the share. All right. 
So here's one of those, again, very, very cool thing uh, in when you're collaborating on content, the sheet view in Excel. Essentially what this is, if you are co-editing, you're, you're manipulating a shared workbook, a, a table uh, that you can go in and manipulate the data and create a custom view without changing the, the, the state of the table without interrupting other people that might be editing. So they might be in there actively updating line items and doesn't matter. You can go create your filtered view of the world. You can share that out or you can keep it for yourself. So how that works. So within uh, you know Excel online, so you've got this here, I've got a very complex demo uh, table there, states <laughs> and colors with numbers. What does it all mean? It's too complicated, Tom. I can't get into that detail. It's it's analysis that you'll have to take <laughs> care of later. I know. I know. <laughs> Click on ideas. There's ideas here. It can tell you what to do with your I data, I think. <laughs> uh, yeah, if there, there are any publishers out there or if NASA is paying attention, yes, I'm available. Uh, <laughs> so within this, so you have in the view, you have the sheet view and by default, this is what everybody goes and sees. So when you select new, what happens is that you get the shadowed, uh, you know, the shading around the box uh, around the space so that you know you're within this custom view and it's called, you know, temporary view. You can save it, name it, whatever you want. You can then apply whatever filters um, right from this view and share that out. So here I've, I've looked at all the states starting with M, complex data set, I know. Um, but it's great about this is I can keep it, save it. I can, uh, you know, uh, share it out. And then the sharing is just like everything else. You can invite other people in, share that view with them. And so that's it. It's the, the ability to go in and invite people in to modify and, and say, hey, maybe you want somebody to provide an edit, but you don't want to bog them down with all of the other data sets. You say, here's this piece that I need your input on. Are we correct for the state of Michigan? and uh, you know, apply the right numbers and that's all that they see, they, they see and get back out. And this goes back to, um, and I, Tom, you, you know this, you've heard me talk about this too, is Microsoft R&D did this product. It was never released as a product, but called GitHub. And if you never saw the demo for this is really exciting. A lot of the capabilities of GitHub and Julia White did a demo at the Microsoft Partner Conference years ago. So if you go and search for Julia White GitHub, it's a really cool demo. But part of the capability, and it just seems so futuristic back then, this is like five, <laughs> six, seven years ago, where she was like, it is like, said, you know what? We need to call in Steve into this web meeting. And they buzzed him in and said, hey, we're reviewing a bunch of financials um, we want you to look at the numbers for this thing that you owe. And so, you know, right there, they were able to go in and highlight, we just want Steve to see this part of the window, invited him in. He provided an update that changes to the stats. They, they thanked him and removed him from the meeting, went back into the full view and how his updates of that one section where he securely only updated and only saw that was relevant to his role. And then the rest of the team could discuss the broader finances. It was a really nice. cool demo. And back then, knowing how some of these tools work, I'm just like, oh, that's all smoke and it's cool. <laughs> it's all smoke and mirrors to get there. It's not that's real. Slideware. <laughs> um, but you know, here we have this, this view, which is uh, one of my favorites. So, uh, all right. So with that, We'll launch the poll for round four. Yeah, that's one of those things that, you know, when you initially think of collaborative editing of things, like, oh, no, no problem. And with Word, it's like, yeah, it's not that big of a deal. But you get into Excel and it's like, I'm going to do a filter here. And you're just working away and all of a sudden all your work goes away. Like, what? <laughs> oh, Sherry points out that it was in the desktop version. Yeah, it it was removed and and now the feature is is back. Yeah, it's uh, I, 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 I don't know if they just changed the underlying you know, technology for the sharing capability and stuff around it that they removed it. But yeah, I noticed that too. All right, gonna end the poll here in five, four, three, 
two, one. All right. All right. We are tied up in the number of rounds here. I took that one, 73%. All right. So let's go into the final round. This determines it, the grand poobah ship of, of uh, this, this event. All right. Archiving a Microsoft team. So a little bit of history here. When Microsoft Teams first launched, um, one of the first things that people started complaining about is, hey, there's no way to archive a team. And the reality is, of course, it's not a simple container. A team has chats and files and tools and you know, and apps. Groups and, and everything. And groups and all <laughs> of those different things that are part of that. There's multiple containers. So to archive that, you had to go in and and suspend the, the group itself. You had to remove permissions there in Teams as well as in SharePoint, make changes in, in Exchange because of the calendar and the sharing capability and the chat and what happens to the chat logs, the chat history, all the conversations and all of those things that you had to worry about. It just wasn't a clean process. There were a couple third-party tools which for years have done migration and, and management of, you know, SharePoint and Teams and to some degree groups. But, you know, again, these were these point solutions around that. Well, in August or September, Microsoft finally provided this way to simply go in and archive a team. Because the main thing is think of it from a user standpoint. Uh, when you want to archive it, essentially what you're doing is you're removing people's permissions and their visibility into that thing. And so if it's removed, it disappears from teams, it's gone to them. From an administrative standpoint, archiving puts it into a holding pattern where you can then figure out what I want to do with it short term or long term. You can reinstate it or you can delete it completely. And then there are some things that you need, need to think about on the back end um, to, to manage those assets. Um, but just to show you what that process looks like. And, and again, to clarify, this is something that an admin does, but within the Microsoft Teams Admin Center, you go into your list of teams, and I created this productivity demo, you select that, that, that team, and up at to the top, you can see the archive button there. So select archive and uh, that process then it gives you a warning like, hey, this is what you're doing. You're about to remove permissions from this team and uh, halt creation uh, within that. Uh, and then you also have the ability right there, which I recommend of making the SharePoint site read only if you are truly uh, locking down the assets, the resources within that. People, of course, if they participated in one-to-one -one or one-to-many chats, um, they'll still have a copy of those chats that's that's part of their personal uh, exchange online, that, you know, they, that personal record. The chats still exist, but the conversations that are within a channel, those will all be frozen and people will be removed from that, be unable to participate to continue on those threads. And so you can also then go down and lock, lock out the, the SharePoint site or lock down the SharePoint site. Once confirmed, so it takes a few minutes to process that. You see that little spinning wheel there in the middle. And then the end of that, so the admin can still see it. It's still there, um, but you have the ability when you select it, uh, you can see up at the top, it now says unarchive. So you've frozen that, you've cleared out, you've shut out users from adding to it and removed it from their visibility, from their navigation within Teams and archived it, paused it. So if you've got a project that is no longer active, but all those assets are still out there, you don't want to break any of those connections and you just want to remove it from active use and maybe in six months you start it up again. Uh, if there's new funding comes in for that project, you have the ability to go and do that with Archive. Yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I'm really surprised. One of the other things I do as part of the community is I do a weekly Microsoft 365 roadmap webcast mm -hmm. <clears throat> with three other people. And I'm surprised that I was not aware of this at all. 
Yes. <laughs> Brand new quietly came out and Dave asked a great question and I'd actually gone and looked and didn't find any reference. So there's nothing in the documentation is how new it is around how this handles private channels, private channels, uh, you know, while within that team operate as a, almost as a separate site collection. And it's so I don't subsite, know the answer. Yeah. yeah. I need to go and find that out. That's a great question, Dave. Yeah, this, this is one of those things that <clears throat> I look at it and go, this is cool. But then all kinds of other questions swirl around my head. It's like, well, do I have a way to just tell the archive? Do I have a you know place where I can put metadata about why it was archived, when it was archived? And the one that probably scares me a little bit more would be with all the changes they make to Teams would there be something in the future that they would make an update and all of a sudden unarchiving something wouldn't work because there's been a structural change underneath the covers that could nail you there. Right. So I, I love the idea that they're doing this because I know that, like you mentioned, there's been third parties that do it, but a lot of times budgets are tight and you're not going to get the ability to do that. Uh, I will just be following this one a lot closer to see how they flesh that out and what kind of features they add on it, because I think this could be really cool. Well, I will be, uh, so after, of course, we'll have the recording everything up of, of all the tips, I will be blogging on uh, each of the tips that I've shared, and I'm, Tom will do the same over on his blog, um, and I will definitely go in and research and try and get an answer on the uh, private channels, because I think that's cool. an important question. I'm I, I'm, I'm going to ask, reach out to uh, some folks like Tony Redman and, and uh, see if there is a, an answer, if that's an open question that's out there. So I don't yeah, know. Could be. Let me go ahead and switch over to mine <clears throat> and see how I can try to stand up against that to see if I can take the final, final round here. <laughs> so the org chart web part in SharePoint Online, I have seen this thing promised for so long and I kept searching for it because in our organization, it seems like every group that has a division or a department side of some sort, like, oh, I need to put the new org chart up. And they've used them in PDFs and they've done them in Word and they've done them with Visio. And it's always kind of a pain for them because they have to put a document out there and make sure that it overlays or update the links or stuff like that. Well, this org chart web part is a great addition keeping in mind that it does what it says on the box, but there's not a whole lot of configuration you can do to it if you wanna go over and above this. So basically I've got a SharePoint Online page here. I click on the plus icon, scroll down, and I see the organization chart web part. So when I go ahead and get that, what I do is I type in the name or the email address of the person at the level that I wanna report on. Uh, keep in mind that this would be like, for me, it would be my manager. If I put my manager's name in there, I'm going to see his name and everybody underneath him and my peers that report to him. Now, if I had gone up like two or three levels, say to my AD, assistant director, I would have only seen the assistant director and the people that report directly to him. So keep in mind when you're picking a name, pick the name that makes more sense to the people who are actually doing the work, not necessarily to the highest level. But if you do want to see a little bit of a chain of, okay, who does my manager report to? If you do get the panel for the um, uh, configuration over here on the right by clicking on the pencil over there, it tells you how many levels if you want to go up. And I want to say, I think I said three on this. Well, I did say three on this one. I want to say it's like five, but I can't remember completely right off the top of my head. But anyway, here I have my manager and then we have his boss, his boss's boss and his boss's boss's boss. So this would be really good on a department division web page where you want to give people an idea of how things are laid out, uh, who reports to whom, stuff like that. Again, this is pretty much all the configuration you can do. So you can't go out and start saying, 
hey, well, I want to get this, but I want to get this cross organization thing and bring in these other people. You really can't do that. Probably the best you're going to be able to do in a case like that is you may need to use multiple org charts to say, okay, I want to allow people to see the org chart from the perspective of who reports to the CIO. And then another web part of who reports to the VP of infrastructure, then another one for director, and then finally the manager with all the people underneath him. The other thing to keep in mind, whoops, the other thing to keep in mind is since this is pulling data from Active Directory, if you have service accounts, not service accounts, but basically super user accounts, stuff like that, that are in Active Directory and they've got manager information associated with them, you are possibly going to see multiple entries for a particular person. So when I look at my manager, I see my regular account, but I also see two of my test account, admin account type things. So keep in mind, it may not be really clean, especially if you're doing this for like an IT group. Um, but in terms of it does what it says it does, this is a really nice low impact way to get an org chart on your page without having to try to maintain something in Excel, Word, <laughs> Visio, whatever. You might want to check this out. And this is not built in Silverlight. <laughs> and this is not built in Silverlight. Gosh, I have not heard that term like that. <laughs> hey, I, I was, I was going to say, I, I was going to throw in while you were talking that is, is your company involved in human cloning? <laughs> <laughs> yes, they just they get a bunch of little minions that are running around there. Uh, so Teams archiving versus the org view web part. Final vote out there. Uh, we'll leave that out there. And let me, uh, while that is running, let me grab the share screen back. I think it would be awesome if we actually tied this round. <laughs> We'll let go for a couple seconds. So overall winner, um, just a reminder while we're waiting for the stats to come in, again, you can go out to Buckley Planet. Up at the top of it, you see the productivity tips, and that will lead you to this post, which has links to all of our past recordings, all the slide decks. And if you click on each one of those for each blog post, we always I always break out with a timestamp to the tip that was shared to the video. So you don't have to listen through the entire hour again. You can jump to that specific tip that was shared that you want to get to. All right, I'm going to close out the survey and... You're going to take it there, my um, friend. Took it. Nice the final job. One. Thank you, everybody. You know, that's three events in a row for me. I was going to say, I thought I had been like, two of three for the last ones that we had done so yeah yeah so we'll uh so with that we don't have another one to promote but we will be back in january or february with a new format it'll still be 10 tips but it'll be more we'll be driving people towards our blog so i think what's going to change here i'm pretty sure this is going to be the fact but tom and i will be uh, coordinating on the topics that we'll cover. So it won't be the versus, the head to head, um, but we're going to shorten the time frame. So we're gonna do this in like 30, 40 minutes. Uh, and we're, we're going to have already blogged about it so that we'll already have reference sites we'll, we're ex we'll, where we will expand on each of the items shared. So I think it'll be a great uh, reference webinar and point you to some of those resources right away. And I will just remind you, Christian, being that we'll be under a bit of a time constraint, so we'll be like, okay, you've got five minutes for yours. I've yep. got five minutes for mine. I still do have my electronic foghorn here. That I think we need to you. break that thing out. I think we might yeah. go that direction. So Yeah, and you don't, you can't touch it, which is nope. awesome. <laughs> Because I know that you I kind know. of were preemptive on some of your uh, some of your horns when we performed live at the SharePoint conference. Well, folks, we are right at time. Thank you so much for participating today. You know, as I said, recording the links, the slides will all be made available out on BuckleyPlanet.com. And so, Tom, thanks a lot. Thank you. Great doing this with you, and we'll see you in the new year. Woohoo! Right. See y'all later. Bye, everyone. Bye.